Thank you. Well, this program is called The Land of the Sun, though yesterday I was wondering if I was going to have to change the title because it was going to rain. And anticipating this, I left my glasses at home. These are my prescription sunglasses. So now I will take them off. Oh, and there you all are. Very good. Over the past 33 years, I have been coming here to the Coachella Valley as first a tourist and now as a winter resident from Chicago. And as a historian, I have done quite a bit of research on the history of this area and talked and interviewed many of the locals, as well as my wife and I have hiked all over this valley in the last 30 years. So the result is this program whose goal is to offer you a balanced perspective of this land of the sun. But first, let's get on Flash Gordon's time machine, and let's go back 11,000 years. And there was a great salt water lake that was, 20, was uh, 2,100 square miles from the Colorado River silt that built up at a delta across the Gulf of California. And that lake bed extended, as you can see, from where it's at further north. Rising faults also, such as the San Andreas Valley, helped to shape the contours and slopes of this valley. And it continues to this very day, as many of you have felt earthquakes on and off, I'm sure, over many different years. Lake Coila was either a freshwater or saltwater lake. It emptied out several times. And at one time, it extended all the way from the Whitewater Pass at the foot of San Gregorio and San Jacinto all the way out to the end of the Salton Sea today. So it was really a vast body of water. As a result of this, when it dried up, the seabed contained many seashells. And it was from this, the corrupted name of Coachella, that the Coachella Valley got its name. And it was adapted by this region in 1909. Now, the oldest residence, the oldest human settlement, is the Coila Native Americans, the Agua Caliente, Toro, Rosano, Cabazon bands, and many others lived in this valley for many, many years. They first came to this valley an estimated 3,000 to 10,000 years ago. Well, here is one of the first condominiums in the Palm Springs area. And what they would do is in this early settlement, the reason they came here is because there was water. They discovered the water ahead of anyone else. The Indians lived in the Indian canyons near Palm Springs. They would live there in the, in the winter, and in the summertime, they go up the mountain to areas such as Idlewild where, uh, today, which, of course, we all visit, and some of you who are really the full-time desert rats. You go up there, too, and have cabins. I know that. In 1774, Juan Baptista de Anza was the first Spanish explorer, and he came near this region, but not right in it. Instead, the Spanish settled along the coast. And the reason they settled along the coast was principally for two reasons. One, there were no roads, and therefore, the ships allowed them to uh, move up and down the coast of California. And secondly, there was water along the coast that they could tap into. Those of you that uh, were here a few weeks ago heard my program on the California missions that first started in 1769 in San Diego with, through Father Junipero Serra. The, Russians had built Fort Ross north of San Francisco, and the Spanish were afraid that they would claim California because there were no Spanish living here before 1769. 
The early American uh, fur trappers and later U.S. government explorers, they would travel near the Coachella Valley, but they tended not to go through it and instead went through the pass at San Bernardino that I'm sure some of you have taken because that's the road to Las Vegas. So this region was avoided. There was no visible water between the Colorado River and the San Bernardino Mountains. And of course, this water would be discovered later and we wouldn't be here today unless there was plenty of it. We're gonna talk about that again later. Now here is a picture of the Whitewater Pass. That's my wife standing in the picture and there you see San, the two big mountains of San Gorgonio, 11,499 feet and Mount San Jacinto, 10,834 feet. Both of those mountains are still rising. San Jacinto has one of the steepest rises in the world. It is a very treacherous mountain, as I think many of you know, because if you stay here any length of time, there seems to always be a tourist that wanders off the trail and they have to rescue them. However, I did talk to a Boy Scout troop leader, and in the summertime, the Boy Scouts lead a guided hikes to the top of San Jacinto, and then later to the top of San Gorgonio. But they know what they're doing, and they camp out. They're ready for it. So this did not change until 1877, where Dr. Murray from Banning opened the Palm Springs Hotel. Now this really was a health resort for individuals who were convalescing from tuberculosis, seeking the dryness, the dry climate. And of course, Palm Springs averages 300 days of sunshine annually. And of course, over 100 days of over 100 degree heat annually. Later, a hot springs bath uh, was built. And you can still see that today, uh, at least the site of the Indian hot springs sitting there uh, in Old Palm Springs. In 1944, the Coila Native Peoples opened a second bathhouse across from the historic Adrian Maxwell House in today's Palm Springs. However, in 1876, on the other end of the valley, the Union Pacific built a rail line to develop agriculture for both the Coachella Valley and the Imperial Valley. The railroad was a hub and it connected to both San Bernardino and then to LA. And in fact, that railroad today, if you go out to the Salton Sea and you hike around, you will see those trains coming up from Mexico or from the Imperial Valley and of course through our pass continuously. After the uh, First World War, date trees were imported from North Africa. The native palms here do not have dates. It is the date trees that were imported from the North African desert. The construction of canals also spread agriculture across both Coachella and the Imperial Valleys. 95% of all the dates grown in the United States comes from this valley. And I'm sure all of you have gone and seen the uh, birth and sex life of a date uh, at the Shields Date Garden. They didn't hire me to give them a plug, by the way. Uh, many other crops, such as lettuce, grapes, and are also grown in this valley and are very important cash crops. In fact, agriculture still remains the number one cash source of uh, funds for the state of California, as it does many other states. Now, this is the road to Palm Springs in 1921. It sort of looks like a compressed Highway 10, doesn't it? Well, this was a major obstacle to further development out here in the desert. And yes, this is snow, and it snowed on Main Street in Palm Springs in 1930. And uh, my mother-in-law, we have a um, album of newspaper clippings, and in the 80s it snowed here, and it only lasted very briefly before it all melted. A major change occurred with early Hollywood silent movies, and they came here for one principal reason, the sun. Because of the antiquated nature of movie making in those days, the brilliant sunlight really aided their black and white film. 
the 1930 movie Lost Horizon, featured Tokwitz Canyon and the waterfall there is Shangri-La. Uh, take the tour there, they'll point it all out to you. It's very interesting. And of course, with the movies came the stars. Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Hope and Crosby became multimillionaires because they bought a lot of land out here, folks, and they sold it for very high prices, as they did in other parts of California. In New Year's of 1928, the El Mirador Hotel opened. It was a hotspot for Hollywood stars and the business elite. In 1942, the hotel was converted to a 16-bed hospital for the military, was reconverted back to a hotel in 1952, and then finally in 1972, the Desert Hospital opened there, a 387-bed acute care hospital and trauma center. In 1934, Ralph Bellamy and Charlie Farrell, they opened the racket club because they couldn't get a tennis court at the El Milador Hotel. So this racket club became a very big hot spot, 200 acres it was built on, uh, and it uh, had numerous tennis courts, swimming pool, the bamboo room, which was very famous in those days, the elite of Hollywood came and stayed there. The club closed in the 1970s and it was ultimately torn down. And now I hear it's going to be, something else is going to be built on that site. Well now here is a map of the region at the end of the 1930s. I want you to note what's on that map and what isn't on that map. Most of the towns you live in aren't there, including this one that we're in today. Major reason is the uh, water resources and other had not yet been developed, and that was going to change after the Second World War. But when World War II began in the 1940s, that brought some very big developments to the desert. First of all, an airport was built here. It was built here not to transport people to Palm Springs, but to ferry aircraft built by Boeing and Grumman and others from the Los Angeles area out here to the desert because of the fear they had that the Japanese would bomb Los Angeles. And from here, the planes were then shuttled by women pilots mainly across the United States and overseas. The first Valley visitors came from LA by train and from the east and west. Here is the Southern Pacific pulling into the Palm Springs Station. The Santa Fe Super Chief also came nearby, but it came to San Bernardino through the uh, San uh, Gregorio Pass. The 1950s and 60s saw this region become even more popular and the growth of many towns outside of Palm Springs itself. A major factor was overcoming the bane of your existence in July, August, September, and even now it's a little warm for us Chicagoans, heat. As Ann Miller said, sang in her song, Kiss Me Kate, it's too darn hot. Well, here it is. The key factor was the air conditioner. The room air conditioner and commercial air conditioning spread throughout the 1950s, and because of this, Palm Springs became a year-round destination. Also flocking to Palm Springs in the 60s were college students on their spring break. They were famous or infamous, depending on how you want to look at it, and they made, of course, a very famous movie called Palm Springs Weekend. That's another discussion, however. During the Second World War, American Airlines initiated its first regular service to the new Palm Springs Airport. This continued after the war. That's why I came out here. How many of you are from the Chicagoland area? Raise your hands. We're taking over. All right. <laughs> However, the arrival in the early 1960s of regularly scheduled jet service brought a flood of people from all of those warm hot spots in January and December and February, like Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, our Canadian uh, neighbors, New York, and elsewhere. They didn't all go to Florida, they came here. 
I also want you to note the exclusive limousine service that American Airlines supplied in those days. <clears throat> In June of 1963, the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway opened. It travels from the desert floor at 450 feet through five actual vegetation zones to 8,200 feet. It is the longest single lift in the world. Uh, it has a, a 40 degree average temperature variation and it's never gotten stuck. Well, that's not quite true. But usually it doesn't. I've taken it many times. I highly recommend it to you. It is, it is meticulously maintained. The sky car they have it now is a new, uh, renovated and expanded car. It's a brand new car, actually. From the 1990s to uh, 2014 also was the fabulous Palm Springs Follies. This was a, a Ziegfeld Folly style dance and musical uh, program, and it uh, revitalized the careers of many uh, former professional dancers and singers. The show attracted 170,000 residents annually until it closed in 2014. Palm Springs also became famous, a center of modernism architectural design. During the 50s and 60s, many homes uh, were built and inspired by this movement. And of course, there's Modernism Week here in February. Pictured here is the Kaufman House, Richard Natera architect, sorry, here is the Kaufman House, sorry, Richard Natera architect. Here is a view from the Fry House number no. two, designed by Albert Fry, built in 63-64. Here is the outdoor area of the uh, Charles Dubois House from 1965. And there are many, many, many more. I'm available for tours at a reasonable fee. In 1951, a real breakthrough occurred, Thunderbird Country Club. This was the first quintessential country club opened in this valley. Before Thunderbird, many people told you, grass won't grow in the desert. Well, they were wrong. Thunderbird is located here in Rancho Mirage, uh, and nearby uh, we have uh, Les Cheney built the first home in 1932 here in Rancho Mirage, and it was first known as Little Santa Monica. Realtors coined the term Rancho Mirage to promote land development along Highway 111 between Bob Hope and Indian Trail. If you ever wanted to know where is this inland empire, you're in it. That was another term coined by realtors to sell desert land. After Thunderbird Oaken, Tamaris Country Club followed in 1952. Soon it was well known because movie stars, Hollywood producers and executives, and captains of industry escaped and relaxed here in Rancho Mirage and in other locations. Also in Rancho Mirage was the famous and unique Desert Air. It opened in 1945. It featured two runways. You flew in, you had your lunch, you stayed a while, and you flew right out. Today, uh, the Rancho Los Palmas Resort is built on that site. Also built in the mid-1960s was the Annenberg Estate, the man who gave you the racing form and TV guide. Today, the Annenberg Estate is now open to view by the public. Unfortunately, its art is at the Metropolitan Museum. I never could understand why they didn't give at least one impressionist painting to the Palm Springs Museum, but that's not for me to say. Desert Island is next to it. It is the only high-rise country club in the valley. Other desert destinations that arose during that time along the Highway 111 corridor was La Quinta. Oh, here's Indian Wells, El Dorado. All right, first, let's go back. There we go, La Quinta. La Quinta was way out in the desert. It was for Hollywood people. It was a deserted Shangri-La where they would have their clandestine rendezvous in the 20s and 30s. Another reason Palm Springs was uh, available and popular with Hollywood people because many of them, as you know, this was the era of the great studios. And written in their contract was they, they could not travel any further than 100 miles from Hollywood. And this is just on the brink of that 100 mile limit. That's why they came here and went out to La Quinta. Indian Wells Country Club followed in 1957. El Dorado opened, I'm sorry, in Indian Wells. It has been famous for its 
uh, past time resident, President Eisenhower, and of course, Eisenhower Mountain that you can march the base through in the living desert. Like the other desert cities, Palm Desert was also caught up in the 40s and 50s development wave. But there was, before there was a Palm Desert, there was Sand Hole. That's what the federal government called it on its map. The residents called it Palm Village. And here is a picture of the first house in Palm Village. World War II brought great activity to the desert with the construction of the Desert Training Center just to the east of this valley. Camp Young was part of these facilities located out east of the valley. A million soldiers were trained there initially for North Africa and then for combat in the Pacific. General George C. Patton organized and commanded the Desert Training Center when it opened, and he used Palm Village as a tank and tr truck depot. Now here is a picture of a spot that you all know because you've driven through it many, many times. This is Highway 111 and Portola in Palm Desert. <clears throat> uh, here's another picture of Highway 111 looking down Portola toward the living desert, uh, the vintage, uh, the reserve, and where I live at Marrakesh Country Club. Looks familiar, yes. At the near Salton Sea, there were numerous testings of something called the atomic bomb. They used the Salton Sea to drop 40 different bomb drops, testing different styles of bombs to see what would work best at the Salton Sea. In fact, there was a great deal of military activity at the Salton Sea, and today we're proud to have here a local historian, Sid Burks. Please get up, Sid, take a bow. And Sid is an expert on this, and talk to him afterwards if you have more questions regarding the Salton Sea uh, area during World War II. Palm Village's first country club was Shadow Mountain. It opened in 1946. It featured its own man-made lake, clubhouse, and a giant figure-eight swimming pool. The resort was an immediate success. A golf course was later added to the facilities. The Cliff and Randall Henderson's brothers were instrumental in the early development of Palm Desert. Now here is an aerial photo of 1950s. You can see Highway 111 on the right, and curving off is where all you ladies love to shop, El Paseo. You can see all those stores. We're just waiting to open. And Portola is running off to the left, where Shadow Mountain was developed. Palm Desert was not incorporated until 1973. A famous local resident there was Philip Boyd. In the 1930s, he was the first mayor of Palm Springs. And he bought 270 acres of land in South Palm Desert. In 1952, he helped to establish the Living Desert. First, through the Palm Springs Art Museum, and later in 1970, it was reorganized as the Living Desert Association. Boyd donated the land to the association with added acreage to the water district. The Living Desert is a major wildlife sanctuary for plants and animals. I'm sure most of you have been there. If you haven't, I highly uh, recommend that you go there. Oh, and by the way, that opening picture I showed you of that oasis. Where was that? Where is that oasis here? Who knows? Anyone can tell me? No? Right. It is the Coachella Valley Preserve. It's the far oasis. You get a ticket to my next program next year for free. <laughs> here is the early establishment of the first buildings of the living desert. It, it, it looked like a desert then, didn't it? The zoo and botanical gardens now cover 4,800 acres, and it is home to 800 animals. Here's a picture I took a few years ago. No, this is not Kenya. This is Palm Desert. And there are many different animals native to the deserts of the world. I took that picture, too. He's resting. The tourists fed him too much. You don't, however, have to go to the living desert to see unique wildlife. This is a picture of a blue heron that I took near my home 
right on in Marrakesh from a few years ago. There was another one there just recently. From the 1970s, scores of other country clubs and private developments mushroomed across the Coachella Valley. Today, over 120 golf courses, tennis clubs, expand, the expansive tennis gardens that have just been expanded, and numerous hiking and riding trails line this valley and its foothills. All of these are part of the desert scene, including the Palm Springs Air Museum, the Palm Springs Art Museum, and uh, more tennis, golf tournaments, film festivals, art shows, music shows, architectural tours, the fashion design show that's about to open, and much, much more held seasonally and at other times of the year. Many presidents and celebrities and figures and corporate leaders have visited the desert, uh, including Bill Gates and his father, who live here part of the time. Here is President Eisenhower, Arnold Palmer, of course, as, uh, I've seen him here numerous times, and the scenic wonders of this valley abound. This is a picture of the, in the Coachella Valley Preserve and a Joshua tree of the full spring bloom. It does happen periodically, though not every year, as you know if you've come here often enough. And of course, the nearby Santa Rosa Mountains hold such scenic splendors as Idlewild, our community at 6,000 feet, and a summer getaway for many of you. The Whitewater uh, Pass has thousands of wind turbines. Guided tours are available to give you an up-close view of one of the largest wind farm generating stations, farms in the world. In the 1950s, aggressive development promoted the Salton Sea Riviera, a playground of boating and fishing and water skiing. I've been there, my mother-in-law uh, in the 50s, went down there with her husband uh, to the marina on the North Shore. Uh, overblown real estate development, pictures of this is, the North, this is the North Shore Yacht Club. Now the future of the Salton Sea figures prominently in the future of this entire valley. It is part of an extensive state of California water irrigation system for, pe for people and for agriculture. Now there are many other green projects. Here we go. All right, there's the Salton Sea. There's the whole California irrigation system. And here is the huge, on the Mojave Desert, the new energy generating solar array, the first of many that will be built. However, the most important the overlooked ecological feature of the Coachella Valley is, without any doubt, the Salton Sea. As we have mentioned, it is part of an ancient lake bed. The current sea was formed in 1905 by a massive breach in the irrigation canal that channeled Colorado River water to this valley and to Imperial. It was caused by a rampaging Colorado flood that did not, it was not restored to its banks until 1907. Over two years, this flooded 350,000 acres of land. It, it filled what is called the Salton Sink. Today, the Salton Sea covers 380 square miles. It is 35 miles long, 9 to 15 miles wide. It is California's largest single body of water. Today, it is fed by water runoff from Imperial Valley and its irrigation system. The All-American Canal is part of this system that brings water to the Coachella Valley and Imperial Valley agriculture. Through the Palm Springs region, though the Palm Springs region has underground aquifers, the growing proliferation of people and development is beginning to drain those aquifers, so water is imported through this system to recharge our aquifers and give us additional water. The source of the Salton Sea water is this runoff from Imperial, and the sea has no outlet. As a result, the water became more and more salty. The water uh, that is there now, fish die off when the temperature rises because of the high salt content, but the water itself from Imperial can be treated and is not toxic. 
Some efforts have been made to address issues and improve the water of the Salton Sea. In the winter, the Salton Sea State Park and Sunny Bono Wildlife Preserve uh, has is a natural fly flyway for hundreds of thousands of birds all along the Pacific Coast that are migrating. Uh, here is a picture of the resort, the North Shore Resort, that was just completely refurbished and then left to stand empty, which shows great planning by the state. Um, I go there every year in January and February hiking with my wife, both to the state park and also out to the Sony Bono. I bring birders. I'm not a birder, but I certainly like looking at birds. Birders that come here are just astounded at the amounts of uh, birds that are in that park. So what does the future hold for the Salton Sea and for the Coachella Valley? Well, there's the, uh, I'm afraid, there's the die off of the fish. And here now, over the past 30 years, there are many studies and proposals that have been made to save the Salton Sea from exposing a gigantic salt flat that's under it. This potential salt dust bowl will cause a major airborne environmental threat to all the communities, both near it and throughout this entire valley and into other parts of Southern California. Concentrated action financially by the Salton Sea area and the government and others is needed today. By 2017, the Salton Sea will begin to drastically disappear. The reason for this is because of an agreement that was reached earlier to begin selling water from Imperial to San Diego. There is a dire need of additional water. A 2014 Pacific Institute study projected that without action, a very real threat of a Salton Sea Dust Bowl deterioration could result in a health care issue and declining real estate range between $29 billion to $70 billion over the next 30 years. As the Salton Sea shrinks, as much as 150 square mile of salt flats is likely to be exposed, giving off large amounts of salt dust and other particulate matter. The Imperial Irrigation District of the Imperial Valley has said it will not now honor the 2003 agreement with San Diego unless the state of California honors its commitment to restore the Salton Sea. Many proposed restorations have been planned and offered and nothing has happened. All of them have been great public expense. I'm happy to tell you about one plan that I'm aware of, and there are many, but this is one that I think maybe will work. This is a private plan. Dick Oliphant is the individual who built the tennis gardens and many other large developments in this valley. Many of you know him as an important community leader and businessman. He has proposed to build three pipelines underground from the Pacific Ocean near Camp Pendleton to the Salton Sea. There will be three pipes, one bringing water in from the Pacific, another taking water out of the Salton Sea and putting it back into the Pacific, and the third will include the wiring and generators needed to do this. At the Salton Sea itself will be a hydroelectric plant. The reason there will be hydroelectricity is that the Pacific Ocean is much higher than the Salton Sea. By that water coming in, it will generate hydroelectric power. That hydroelectric power will be used to desalinate the water into the Salton Sea, as well as to sell it, because there will be copious amounts of water to be used throughout the entire Southland. And it will also generate electricity that can be sold. This is privately funded, uh, and it will uh, ultimately generate a great deal of revenue. Hopefully, water conservation across the valley and its economic diversification will happen. And it's already begun to take effect. To move the valley away from its current economy reliance just on agriculture and tourism. The Coachella Valley Economic Partnership that many of you know is an attempt to, to expand IT, light manufacturing, improve health care, and technology and bring them in these industries into the valley. 
The Valley's effort also is made to upgrade local school systems and expand educational opportunities to year-round Valley residents. The Coachella Valley Economic Partnership, through businesses and the communities here, have worked with the school systems to establish 15 career academy high schools, enro en enrolling 2,500 high school students in healthcare, hospitality, recreation, tourism, the arts, media, entertainment, and advanced technology careers to attract these industries and to provide you with the health care that you need if you are living here full time. As president of Imperial Consulting Corporation and the author of many studies on the shortage of skilled people in the United States and around the world, I can tell you that this effort is critical, particularly for the full-time residents of this valley and for the continued economic viability of this entire region. The ultimate target of this program is to enroll 30% of the Valley's 20,000 students in these career pathway programs. The Coachella Valley uh, the, and the Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage, Indian Wells, and all the other communities, this whole region has a worldwide reputation as a winter-like bit of paradise. However, as more retirees make their homes here on a year-round basis, it is necessary to generate the economy to support these developments. I am confident with, with the greater collaboration of the desert communities through their enlightened leadership, this ideal environment that we all love can be preserved and the nature's balance maintained for many generations yet to come. Thank you very much.